Hello and thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Support us on Patreon if you can. We always appreciate your feedback, and Academy-themed gear was recommended in the recent live stream, and we want to thank everyone who participated in that discussion. In response to that suggestion, we now have Terran Space Academy-themed items available on eBay. Look up Terran Space Academy, get yourself a little something for the holidays, and let us know what you think. We don't often cover current events, but several recent space-related occurrences have prompted us to evaluate some recent problems of spacecraft. It is our goal to help explore and colonize space by giving you an education in the fundamentals of space science so that you can have a bright future in the space industry. Some of us will go on to run our own aerospace companies. Thousands of new companies will be needed over the next two decades. We want to make sure that when you are running your space industry company, that you have a corporate philosophy that will help you succeed. Let's look at some recent examples of space industry success and failure so we can learn from their experience. Lockheed Martin is an aerospace company created by the merger of Lockheed Corporation with Martin Marietta in 1995. The resulting company employs 110,000 people worldwide. 76% of Lockheed Martin's income is from the United States military contracts receiving nearly 10% of all Pentagon spending. They are currently developing the F-35 Lightning II fighter plane and this product for NASA, the Orion spacecraft. The Orion is a multi-purpose vehicle designed to be partially reusable. It will have a design life of 21 days in space with a mass of a little more than 10 tons and will be mated with a service module designed by the European Space Agency, which has a mass of 15 tons. It has a crew capacity of 2 to 6 astronauts and can return up to 100 kilograms of payload. It is 3.3 meters by 5 meters and has a usable volume of 20 cubic meters and a habitable volume of 9 cubic meters. It is solar powered with one J-10 rocket engine for primary propulsion that is a pressure-fed hypergolic system using nitrogen tetroxide and aerosene 50 with a thrust of about 44 newtons. If you need an update on this system, review this course. It has eight R4D11 engines on the bottom of the craft using nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine with a total thrust of 490 newtons for secondary propulsion. The R4D is a legacy design used for the reaction control systems on the Apollo Command Module. There are six pods of air-based reaction control system thrusters on the Orion, and the Orion uses a glass cockpit concept designed for the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Lockheed Martin is the prime contractor, and have a contract for six spacecraft with an option for six more. This spacecraft is planned to carry the first woman and next man around the moon in 2024 on the Artemis III mission according to the Lockheed Martin website, though I think this has probably slipped. The Orion program started in 2006 for the Constellation Moon program, which would have used the Ares-1 rocket, and was continued in 2010 after the cancellation of Constellation for the Asteroid Redirect mission, which was then canceled to go back to the moon again with the Artemis Moon program, using the Space Launch System. And now who knows? Four test vehicles have been built and one flown in 2014 with the Exploration Flight Test 1 mission using a Delta IV heavy rocket to test re-entry. The flight lasted four hours, making two orbits with a high energy re-entry at 32,000 km per hour to simulate a lunar return and test the heat shield. The mission went well and the capsule splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and was recovered. Right now, three more are under construction with a fourth to come later, giving a total fleet of four test vehicles and four flight vehicles. The Orion capsule is integral to the Space Launch System and Artemis programs, having been selected to carry the astronauts for those missions. On September 1st of 2020, NASA announced that the Orion was flight ready after a final checkout of a system acceptance and design certification review examining every aspect and system of the spacecraft. NASA reported that, the review examined not only the vehicle hardware, but also the production quality, safety procedures, and operations manuals that are integrated within the spacecraft operation. Now that the review is complete, the vehicle is ready to be mated to NASA's Space Launch System rocket in preparation for its launch that will take the spacecraft around the moon and return it back to Earth. That sounds great. 
until you see this article in the news. Component failure in NASA's deep space crew capsule could take months to fix. Engineers are figuring out how to replace a failed power unit in Orion. It goes on to say in The Verge, Engineers are racing to fix a failed piece of equipment on NASA's future deep space crew capsule Orion ahead of its first flight to space. It may require months of work to replace and fix. Right now, engineers at NASA and Orion's primary contractor, Lockheed Martin, are trying to figure out the best way to fix the component and how much time the repairs are going to take. In early November, engineers at Lockheed Martin working on Orion noticed that a power component inside the vehicle had failed, according to an internal email and an internal PowerPoint presentation seen by The Verge. The component is within one of the spacecraft's eight power and data units, or PDUs. The PDUs are the main power data boxes for Orion, according to the email, responsible for activating key systems that Orion needs during flight. Here you can see a power and data unit, and here you can see where it is in the spacecraft. The Orion capsule was not made with repairs in mind. See this beautiful hand-built automobile? It is a work of art. And for only a little more than a million dollars, you can drive this around, getting about six miles per gallon, with $800 tune-ups about every 90 days, and a long wait for parts or repairs. Or for a little less, you could own this Toyota Camry Hybrid. It gets 50 miles per gallon, has a leather interior, nice stereo system, lane following, and will almost certainly run at least 100,000 miles without any repairs at all. The Orion capsule is the Bugatti. It turns out that after a decade of development, this one failed component means the Orion capsule may have to be separated from the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle service module that it has been mated with in preparation for launch on the SLS. This alone could take at least nine months. Then the repair has to be made and the capsule remated with subsequent retesting of all connections and systems, taking several more months. Or they can try to get to the component through the outside of the ship which is not designed for this procedure and would still take at least four months. Or they can just fly it with this problem and no redundant backup if they have another failure in this specific PDU. But this is an unproven spacecraft and a critical component has failed while it is still on the ground. How certain can we be that the backup system won't fail in space? That brings us to two critical issues with current and future spacecraft design. The first issue is how we build and test spacecraft, and the second is how we can make repairs, especially during operations. Spacecraft up to this point in history have been single-use systems, hand-built for one specific purpose. The closest thing to a repairable spacecraft has been the International Space Station. A lot of space enthusiasts are not happy that humans have stayed in low Earth orbit for the last half century, and I agree with this sentiment. We should have had explorers continuously on the moon all this time, but we did not. And there have been a lot of equipment failures, pressure leaks, and repairs on the ISS to help us hone our skills and justify its existence somewhat. If you're going to have a failure, low Earth orbit is where you want to be. There are always Soyuz lifeboats attached to the ISS, and if an unrecoverable emergency had occurred, these could have been used to evacuate the station. Besides the space station, we are looking at several vehicles being designed for space operations. We just covered the Orion and the fact that one simple component failure has sidelined it for at least six months and almost certainly a year. Are these problems unique to the Orion capsule? And this failure occurred on Earth. How are we ever going to explore and colonize the solar system if we can't make an emergency repair of our spacecraft? How can we spend billions of dollars and end up with something that breaks easily and is very hard to fix? And remember, the SLS was supposed to launch this capsule for an operational mission in 2017. Orion is not the only company with spacecraft development problems. The Starliner spacecraft, or CST-100, is being built by Boeing. Production also started in 2010 for this spacecraft with an initial award of $18 million and a second phase award of $93 million for a total of $111 million. Development started in 2011 and an additional $460 million was awarded. September of 2014, NASA selected the Starliner and the SpaceX Crew Dragon for the Commercial Crew Transportation Capability Program and awarded Boeing an additional $4.2 billion in contracts. 
The Starliner can hold a crew of up to seven people and can remain in orbit for up to seven months. It is reusable for up to 10 missions. It has a mass of 13 tons with a length and width about 5 meters by 4.5 meters. It has a pressurized volume of 11 cubic meters. Three have been built and one launched so far. Let's discuss that launch. The Starliner is compatible with the Atlas V, Delta IV, Falcon 9, and the proposed Vulcan Centaur rocket. It was launched on December 2019 from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral on an Atlas V N22, meaning no fairing, two solid boosters, and two engines on the Centaur second stage. During this test, the spacecraft lost track of time, having received bad timing data, giving it an 11-hour error something the simplest cell phone is capable of avoiding. This led the spacecraft to think it was in an orbital insertion burn when it was not, and it started firing its attitude control thrusters to correct. This caused it to burn up almost all of its available fuel for these thrusters, making it impossible to dock with the ISS as had been planned. But that was a good thing, because while in orbit, two more software errors were detected that could have resulted in destruction of the spacecraft. One of these errors was that, after jettisoning the service module, software controlling its thrusters would not have fired properly, and a collision between the service module and capsule was possible. Now, the capsule was still able to land on the ground safely, which was a first for an American capsule. Usually, they land in water. A review found 80 more problems that had to be corrected. Now, remember, this was the shakedown flight. The next flight was supposed to have astronauts on board. Needless to say, these problems made that impossible, and Boeing is supposed to retest this vehicle at its own expense. Lockheed Martin and Boeing spent years and hundreds of million dollars developing these spacecraft. Why were these problems not identified during development? And how did a company like SpaceX, founded in 2002, two years after Lockheed and Boeing started building their ships, accomplish so much in such a short time? In 2010, SpaceX put a Dragon capsule in orbit and returned it with no problems. In 2012, they docked a Dragon capsule to the ISS. They tested a crew-capable Dragon capsule in orbit March 2019 and sent a crew to the ISS on a Dragon 2 capsule 30 May 2020. SpaceX started two years later than Lockheed or Boeing and are flying operational missions as we speak. What is the difference between these companies and what we can learn about sustainable spaceflight operations? Rule 1. Off the shelf when possible. Lockheed and Boeing have almost everything custom built by subcontractors. SpaceX uses as many off the shelf components as possible. SpaceX spacecraft run on proven x86 dual core processors running LabVIEW, which is a graphic programming interface, through a Linux operating system. Custom algorithms are written in C or Python. SpaceX does not use the very latest six-core processors. It does not write all custom software. It uses components that have been tried and proven whenever possible. Rule number two, build your own stuff when you can't find it off the shelf. Lockheed and Boeing hardly build any of the components of their ships anymore. They contract out almost everything, then put it all together. This causes them to lose complete control over these components and makes them dependent on the quality control protocols of other companies they do not directly control. SpaceX builds everything in-house that they possibly can and anything contracted out is taken apart and tested in every detail before being accepted. Rule 3. Test everything. Keep only what is good. Boeing and Lockheed build very expensive vehicles that they try to make perfect the first time. Custom-built spacecraft with the equivalent of a Ferrari or Lamborghini. These are beautiful vehicles, but how often do you think they crash test a Lamborghini? If you want to know how your capsule will perform in orbit with a crew, throw it up a dozen times with cargo first. Work out the problems without humans on board. Don't make your first operational test one flight before your first banned mission. Too much can go wrong. That is a recipe for disaster. Rule 4. The difference between a failure and a lesson is what you learn. SpaceX is not afraid to build it, fly it, crash it, and build it again. Nothing shows this philosophy better than the development of Starship taking place right now. They are building these massive spaceships that are taller than 10 stacked Orion or Starliner capsules, then putting on the minimum flight control systems and engines necessary to test the components. This type of rapid prototyping and testing guarantees that some things will go wrong, 
but that's okay. This is the time to build things cheap and break them. Learn all the things that can easily go wrong and make a checklist. Don't underpressurize a tank with a fill tank above it. Check. Make sure your fueling line disconnect doesn't malfunction. Check. Make sure your engine doesn't catch on fire. Check. Developing robust systems that are relatively easy to build and repair is essential to success in spaceflight. If you do this well, you will end up with a comprehensive checklist to prevent problems, and you will finally have a completed test vehicle, like this one, possibly launching today. Mr. Musk says there is one in three chance that this test will fail, but he also said that serial numbers 9 and 10 are just about ready for testing. Follow these rules, and you have a much higher chance of success in the space industry. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Support us on Patreon if you can. Look up some nice items for Christmas on eBay. And stay safe.